This isn't a spoiler-free discussion. In fact, it is the exact opposite. This video is meant to be my theory of how all of the story elements of Final Fantasy VII Remake really line up. And since we know that Remake takes place as the fifth and final part of the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, we are going to be deconstructing every bit of relevant information and how all of that pertains to the events of Remake. I'll try and put things into as much context as I can for those who might not have knowledge of the Final Fantasy VII franchise, but you should absolutely be familiar with the end of Remake before watching this video. That being said, let's get right into it. From what I can tell from listening to other people talk about Final Fantasy VII Remake is that they have most of the elements of the story understood. They get the meta of the ghosts are reinforcing the timeline of Final Fantasy VII. They get that Sephiroth has started time traveling or has somehow become aware of the timeline and has control over the specters to some degree. We know at the end of the remake that fate is severed and multiple timelines are created and a past version of Zack also has some uncertain future. Anna Aerith knows way more than she should, but those things seem to be taken at face value and we're not really sure of the finer details of those plot elements. And also we're kind of unaware of the intent of the characters. We know that Aerith knows about the plot of Final Fantasy VII, but how much does she know outside of that? Yes, she knows who Sephiroth is, but does she know Sephiroth's plan as they happen in the original Final Fantasy VII? Or does she know about the time meddling Sephiroth's plans? Why does Aerith use this unknown magic to change the portal that Sephiroth creates? Why did the portal need to be changed to begin with? If Sephiroth is time traveling, why and how? Why did Sephiroth need to influence things in this particular time in order for things to go his way? Is Sephiroth and everyone seem to be freed from the control of destiny? Why does Sephiroth still need Cloud at the end of the game to live? If anything, there is now a greater importance to Cloud and Sephiroth's relationship, beyond just the reunion and the events of the original game. And this also begs the question of how much power does Sephiroth actually have? We know that he has an abundance of power at the end of the game, but what about the beginning of the game and on? Why is the color inside of the Spectre purple? And why does that color show up literally throughout the entire game and how it is associated specifically with Sephiroth from the very beginning of the game? Why are the Spectres shown to have this direct link to this color? What happens to Biggs here? Is this him being brought back to life? It seems like the Spectres turned into these lights. So is this big soul returning to him? Wouldn't these souls just return to the live stream? After looking through literally frames of the scenes from Remake and the movie, reading the goings on in between the events of Final Fantasy VII and Advent Children from the short stories, and looking at the events of Dirge of Cerberus and Crisis Core, yes, I am fucking serious, Dirge of Cerberus is actually important to this, all of the answers that we've been looking for are not found by looking forward, but found by looking back. So without any more padding to this, I'm just going to give you my theory. A future Sephiroth with little power in the physical world other than his presence agitates the timeline. The planet already sick with Sephiroth's stigma caused the planet to defend itself by summoning the spirits that make up the flow of time in the life stream. Once it is too much damage done for the planet to repair within the means of the singular spirits, the planet summons a weapon to defend the timeline. This weapon has two functions. To control the entire timeline that the Lifestream wants to enforce by using the spirits that make up the Lifestream. The second purpose, to keep Sephiroth and anything connected to Genova from ever claiming victory over the planet in the future. A job dictated by the universe itself to be this planet's singular purpose. And by tricking you into defeating the weapon, Sephiroth has now caused all of the balance in time to break, leaving not only the fate of Gaia, but the fate of the entire Final Fantasy VII universe in danger. And it's all your fault. On the way to a smile. Most notably, we're going to be talking about the black and white chapter, which goes over the events of what Sephiroth and Aerith are doing before the events of Final Fantasy VII Advent Children. In the events at the end of Final Fantasy VII, Sephiroth, being defeated by Cloud, is sent to the livestream, but does not become a part of it. Because of this, Sephiroth is unable to enact his original plan to absorb the livestream as previously intended. 
In order to save the planet, Aerith uses the life stream to spread out, which defends the planet from Meteor. While the life stream spreads over the planet to arrive at Midgar, where the meteor impact will take place, Sephiroth seizes the opportunity to infect those in Midgar and around the world who came into contact with the Lifestream in this moment with Geostigma. Because Aerith summons the Lifestream, the meteor is stopped and humanity is safe for a couple of years. Sephiroth, having used all of his memories of his life as a human to reinforce meteor, becomes susceptible to dissolving into the Lifestream. In order to keep himself whole in the Lifestream, Sephiroth binds his core to clouds like a parasite. From this point on, as long as Cloud knows who Sephiroth is, and as long as there is any memory or a part of Genova that exists, he will always be able to maintain his form in the livestream and have a presence in the physical world of the planet if he so chooses. You can also interpret the idea that Cloud has Genova cells in him, which is how this is possible. The short story uses hatred as describing this infection. So just to clarify that anytime you hear the word hatred, Sephiroth's influence, Genova cells, or memories of Sephiroth, or Geostigma, they all keep the same function of keeping Sephiroth alive. And Sephiroth is able to act through those things, which is really bad. Then we catch up with Aerith. After Aerith's death, she is able to choose to retain her conscious form in the livestream. This is because of her Cetra heritage. Aerith becomes aware of Sephiroth in the livestream, but from how the short story describes this, not only does she not have any power over Sephiroth in the livestream, she fears for her own life even trying to get close to him, as she is not sure what will happen to her if she does. This is likely due to the fact that any presence of Genova in the livestream has the ability to corrode, but we'll get to that. Aerith starts to notice this influx of spirits. These spirits, who are infected because of Sephiroth's influence, refuse to join the livestream. Aerith realizes that as long as she is able to release the underlying emotions in the hateful spirits, the infection has nothing to cling to. But Aerith realizes that she cannot heal all of the incoming spirits on her own. So she seeks the help of other Cetras, whose minds and consciousness have mostly joined the livestream, but are able to aid her in her quest. She also enlists the souls of her friends. This is important to note for when we get to remake, so keep this in mind. But even with the companions she has gathered, they were unable to stop the overwhelming number of souls. The only way that Aerith knows how to stop the influx of infected spirits is to heal those infected with Geostigma before they can even leave the physical world. This seems to be her only choice, as it seems that the task is too overwhelming. And as we will see moving forward even after the events of Advent Children, this problem persists. On to Advent Children. And there are a lot of really important details to take away here. The first one involves Kadaj and Rufus. Kadaj, while badgering Rufus about where Genova's head is, have an exchange about the live stream, mainly about how time seems to operate in the live stream. That based on the way that the live stream flows, it is likely that history is doomed to repeat itself over and over for Sephiroth and Genova. Most notably, that they will always lose no matter what happens, because that is the will of the live stream. And this is true. The obvious ones being that after the events of Advent Children, that this will be the third time that Sephiroth was sent to the livestream. And this conversation between the two is saying that the only real reason that this is, is because the livestream is directly preventing Sephiroth from ever winning, regardless of what form he takes to do so. You might see where I'm going with that, but don't get too ahead of yourself. There's way more to this than meets the eye, but we'll talk about it later. At the end of Advent Children, Sephiroth explains to Cloud that he wants those who are infected with Geostigma to contaminate the livestream, corroding and corrupting it. Note that from what we already know, that Geostigma has already been around for two years at this point. So Sephiroth isn't telling Cloud what he is going to do, he is telling Cloud what he has already done. And as a fun aside, Sephiroth only wants to show up in Advent Children because he wants to rub it all in Cloud's face. He wants the credit for doing all of this shit. And upon defeating Sephiroth, tells Cloud that he will never just be a memory and disappears from the physical world. Aerith casts Healing Rain in order to cure the affliction of Geostigma and the cure is found. But a fun fact is that the Healing Rain is only in Midgard and that although a cure is found, we soon find out that in the year to come, there are still those who are infected with Geostigma across the planet. 
So the takeaway here is that Advent Children is kind of an isolated event. The party saves Midgar and prevents the physical manifestation of Sephiroth returning, but that's not saying, <laughs> but that's not saying that much, all things considered. While Sephiroth's body was destroyed and Kadaj and his bros returned to the livestream, Cloud still lives and Geostigma still exists. And if those two things exist, then Sephiroth lives. Because of this, we can assume that at the end of Advent Children, the infected spirits are still in the livestream, and Aerith is still joined with the remaining Cetra and her friends in the attempt to heal the remaining souls that were corrupted by the livestream. Enter Dirge of Cerberus. Yeah, I am fucking serious, this is important. But I'm gonna try and keep it brief, but some of the story elements have a strong indication of why Sephiroth appears in the past rather than continuing to pursue his actions in the future. The first one being pretty significant. We know that in the events of Dirge, that Geostigma is still present, and there's an important note about the infected too. Deep Ground attempts to summon Omega. Their objective is to murder a large group of people in order to make the planet feel like it's being threatened, so that it will defend itself and summon the life stream. Here's the thing. We find out that the souls infected with Geostigma do not trigger the planet's will to protect itself, and thus labeled as impure. These people are simply killed. This means that everyone who's inflicted with geostigma is deemed by the planet as a threat, and it wants nothing to do with them. Just like the way all of weapons work in Final Fantasy VII, no matter what the threat is, it is the will of the planet to protect itself by any means necessary. This means that for five years that the planet still has souls corrupted by geostigma leaking into it, and that Sephiroth is still corroding the livestream, meaning that Aerith, the rest of the remaining Cetra, and her friends are still most likely dealing with Geostigma. I don't even want to talk about this. I want to just jump right into the fucking Omega shit because that was hype as fuck. We get a new lesson about the livestream, and that upon the planet's death, all life in the livestream of this planet returns to an even bigger livestream. In the end of Dirge, the vessel of this reunion to the central life stream is destroyed by Vincent, as it means the end of the planet. There are a lot of things to consider. If the way of reaching the bigger source of the life stream is through this vessel, was it fate that dictated the event of its destruction? And this brings up a really important question. Why would the universal life stream want Sephiroth inside of it? It wouldn't. The livestream would never want that corrosion to reach a large source of the livestream. Advent Children Sephiroth brings this up, that using the planet as a vessel, he is going to sail through the cosmos. He doesn't mean literally the planet, he is talking about using the livestream of the planet. As a result of Omega's death, the planet and Sephiroth have no way of reaching the larger livestream. This is fucking bonkers because you would think that this is bad. I think this is exactly what the livestream wanted. I think that this was destined to happen, and that the reason is because the livestream wants to keep Sephiroth contained. The planet Gaia, at this particular point in time, now serves in the grand scheme of things as a prison for Sephiroth and Genova. So what does the planet do? The larger livestream dictates destiny, that the planet Gaia be cut off from the larger life stream in order to contain the contamination. And with no way of Sephiroth to leave the planet, the rest of the souls of Gaia's sole purpose is now to do one thing, contain Genova and contain Sephiroth. So even if the planet's life stream were to become corroded enough to infect it with Geostigma, Sephiroth would still be trapped on the planet. But because of this, Sephiroth devises a different way to escape. This sets up a very important role to be filled in Remake, the Spectres and the Harbinger. Leading up to Final Fantasy VII Remake, Sephiroth considers how the planet has some mechanic that dictates not only time itself, but has the tight hold over Genova's and his destiny. Since the livestream in Dirge is severed from the larger livestream, Sephiroth must go back to a place where he can accomplish this goal, the goal of reaching the larger livestream. With that in mind, he plans to break the set cycle of time, the cycle of time that the life stream reinforces. How does he do that? Sephiroth learns that the timeline is made up and reinforced by individual spirits that belong in the life stream, and that these spirits exist in all points in time throughout history at once. 
This is why we're able to see specters in the Zack cutscene and in the present events of the remake as they are taking place. Sephiroth is able to use his influence through the individual infected spirits that he has gathered throughout the Final Fantasy VII timeline. Knowing that many of these spirits have most likely been able to infiltrate the livestream at this point, because of this influence, he is able to access the timeline. And I believe this includes the spirits from the events of On the Way to a Smile and the ones we know of in the events of Advent Children and Dirge. This means that Aerith and some of the characters from Final Fantasy VII that we know and those infected souls of the livestream are most likely going to become a part of the souls that we see in Remake, the Spectres. So it's important to know that all these souls, meaning that while they still might have consciousness, they are herded by the planet to do its bidding. Keep this in mind because this is going to be important moving forward. And through the will of the planet uses the souls of the dead to move the flow of time in the direction that it chooses. What does this flow lead to? A future where Sephiroth is trapped by the destiny dictated by the planet. So keeping this in mind moving forward that although this means that the livestream is already infected, it isn't corrupted enough to where Sephiroth is able to actively break free of destiny through his will alone. Jump to Final Fantasy VII Remake. Now to get started, Sephiroth chooses the perfect time and place for him to appear. He chooses the time because this is the moment where Cloud and Aerith are present and meet. Another reason for this particular moment is that Aerith is not aware of what the Spectres are, which is a huge advantage for Sephiroth. This allows Sephiroth to take advantage of her ignorance of the situation. I think another factor is Midgar, but we'll get to that. Sephiroth appears at the start of Final Fantasy VII in order to agitate the planet to make it defend itself. It does this by sending the Spectres. This makes the Spectres appear in front of Aerith. This is possible through the fact that Aerith is a Cetra. And through her, Sephiroth wants Cloud to see this as well, so he further delays their conversation so that Aerith is able to once again get attacked and transfer this sight to Cloud, an ability that we see her use countless times throughout the remake. Which means that the planet must realign the pieces of the timeline further by sending more Spectres. This is what causes the entire party to become aware of the timeline through the Spectres. If you were wondering, this is also why the party at 7th Heaven is able to see the Spectres, because too many pieces of the timeline at this point require harsh actions to set time back into place. It is notable that Sephiroth is using the Spectres to reinforce that they succeed at this particular point in time. We see this through the Spectre keeping Cloud asleep, and we see this in the Igmatic Spectre. At the end of the game, things have gone so far off track that the Spectres are swarming over Midgar. And this is exactly what Sephiroth wants. Even though Sephiroth created these chain of events, Sephiroth is not able to act of his own free will himself from his destiny. Instead, he has to create the moment in time in which the planet's timeline is in such jeopardy that it needs to manifest the Harbinger. All things considered, the Harbinger is the weapon of the planet that is tasked to destroy the threat, your party. The Harbinger does not only reinforce time, but enforces that all of destiny, including Sephiroth's defeat throughout history, continues to take place. The future that you are actively fighting against. The future that you are actively fighting against is the one that Sephiroth wants you to defeat. The purple ball in the Harbinger's chest represents a contained Sephiroth, the Spectre's body stretching over it in the form of a cage-like body to prevent Sephiroth's escape, his escape from his own destiny. The purple color is associated directly to Sephiroth throughout the Final Fantasy VII Remake. And the cool part is, is that Final Fantasy VII Remake does this from beginning to end. In the alleyway cutscene, the first cutscene of the game, there is something significantly different that you may not have noticed. The color purple, which can be seen in the alleyway behind Aerith. This is also cued into view by Sephiroth's signature song, The One-Winged Angel. This directly ties this color to Sephiroth, and it's not a coincidence either. We see it in the shot right after this. We see it in the Enigmatic Spectre, a Spectre that oversees the other Spectres trying to keep Cloud and the others in place as Sephiroth enacts his plan through the Spectres to knock Jesse down. Later we see in Shinra's virtual tour, 
the color purple manifesting the twisted future of the planet. Genova is also shown to have this color not only in her holding chamber, but also depicts the color of Genova's blood. Sephiroth creates a large portal and the same color is depicted. When you get through the portal, what do you see? A giant cloud of purple energy that the specters are trying to contain. They form around Sephiroth to create a prison. What happens after this? We see the color purple and green mixed together to create the threads of the life stream that give you the memories of Advent Children. This is showing us directly that although Sephiroth may not have enacted his plan fully in the future, the life stream is contaminated. I think this also depicts the balance of both green and purple, that this is the harmony dictated by the planet. I will continue to mention the color association, but we have arrived at the end of Final Fantasy VII Remake. Now that isn't necessarily to say that there isn't more to talk about, uh, especially with Remake, and we're gonna get to the more specific things, but I think that since we have context for the ending, we might as well get it out of the way now. So what happens when you defeat the Harbinger? This does a couple of things. It frees Sephiroth from his destiny. Without knowing it, Aerith and her party free Sephiroth by unbinding him from the control that the Harbinger has had over him throughout the entire timeline. It also frees the Spectres, where they were once able to stop Sephiroth from making direct and irreparable damage to the timeline before this event is no longer the case. From this point forward, Remake and beyond, Sephiroth has succeeded in his mission. Whatever happens from this point on in the Remake, he is now free from the main confines of the life stream, that being his destiny. And now the planet is unable to dictate the balance that has worked so hard to preserve throughout the entire Final Fantasy VII compilation timeline. The scale can tip whichever way it wants now. The flow of good and evil is now completely imbalanced. All of that harmony is gone because of you. And there's a lot more details that, that make this more interesting, but we're going to get to that. We really need to get to all of this Sephiroth stuff. Now, a different type of reunion takes place. And in a moment of weakness, without direction, no harbinger, a state that is a direct action of the party, the specters are unable to stop Sephiroth from taking complete control over them. Because of Geostigma and because of all of his work in Advent Children, all of the souls that he collects are ones that he himself has infected throughout the corrosion of the life stream. In fact, it could be the entire life stream. Of, of the future. We don't, it's, it, it's, it varies, but we know that it's a fuck ton. Take note of the color that he is now, and rather than it being this large, unfocused entity that is trapped by the Harbinger, Sephiroth has fully formed in front of us with this color that has never been as bright, and he looks so fucking evil. Instead of being trapped by the Harbinger, Sephiroth has become the Harbinger, or as I like to call him, Harbinger Sephiroth. If that doesn't make you fucking pee your pants, I don't know what will. It's notable that he actually starts sucking in Meteor here, which out of context does not make any sense, but actually is very important to understand the scope of what's going on here. Sephiroth brings us after the destruction of the Harbinger to the events of Meteor at the end of Final Fantasy VII, and he absorbs the Spectres and the Meteor. We know that it's the end of Final Fantasy VII because Red 13 actually mentions the fact that he recognizes the place. This is super important to know because the only reason Red 13 recognizes this place is because Aerith told him that it was. This is really important to knowing exactly how much Aerith knows, uh, but we will get to that at a later part of the video. Unlike the Sephiroth that we have been dealing with before this moment, that has no physical body of acting through, this is the true body of Sephiroth, same as depicted in Final Fantasy VII and later in Advent Children. And this is actually possible because he absorbed Meteor. Sephiroth is unable to form a physical body in his own image in Advent Children. The reason for this is in the short story. It's because Sephiroth has put all of his memories of his life into Meteor in order to strengthen it. So in order for Sephiroth to act in the physical world, he needs a conduit to be able to connect to a source of his image in order to resurrect himself. 
This is the reason why Kadaj and the other brothers are born. They are born from his will in order to seek out Genova in order to reclaim some knowledge of his physical form. That's why Kadaj and his brothers aren't just direct images of Sephiroth. I think that this is the importance of Midgar. Sephiroth creates a portal in time to the moment where Meteor is about to take place. So what we're seeing here is Sephiroth pulling all of the memories back into himself, allowing for his physical body to manifest itself. And we see this body forming. It isn't just already there. It appears once Meteor and the Spectres are absorbed. At the end of the game, you defeat Harbinger Sephiroth, and the ghosts that were in the area are freed from his control. I think more importantly that they are cured from Geostigma through the actions of the party, which is super important going forward. And this is most likely the reason for Aerith's portal before you guys step through. In the final moment, Sephiroth uses the Spectres to stop Cloud from attacking him. This is normal that the Harbinger would be able to stop certain things from taking place, and instead decides to take Cloud into the livestream to have a chat. Sephiroth leaves Cloud alive, as it is the only way that Sephiroth has been able to exist after the events of Final Fantasy VII. Their souls are linked. It's important to address that in the scene, Sephiroth seemingly doesn't have the same amount of control that he had with the Whispers before. As they all disappear, maybe he willfully uses them as a shield in order to eliminate any other Harbinger from using the Spectres to ever reinforce the timeline again? This means that Sephiroth goes back to being in the same state that he was at the beginning of the game. I think that it is also possible that this Sephiroth, having no more control over the Spectres, will no longer continue to exist after this conversation with Cloud and that the Sephiroth that we will now be facing is the Sephiroth from the original timeline. This is also notable through the fact that Geostigma seems to be cured, which is the only tie for the future Sephiroth to have to this world. And I know that I mentioned Meteor before and how that gave him a physical body in this timeline, but he re-summons Meteor and that could have just undone the fact that he had just brought back his physical body. But knowing that the Sephiroth from this original timeline has been in the livestream up until this point as well, he probably is fully aware of the future selves meddling and is completely prepared to do what he needs to do in order to carry out the wishes of his future self for his own benefit. Instead of Sephiroth wanting Cloud to suffer, he offers Cloud the option to join him. This is extremely odd. All Sephiroth has wanted to do up until this point is torment Cloud. He wants him to remember him and scar him emotionally and physically in every possible way so that he can keep the memory of Sephiroth alive up until this point. I think the reason that Sephiroth does this is because now the one loose end to Sephiroth's remaining presence in the timeline is Cloud. Sephiroth knows fully well that in the final battle in Remake that is going to take place at some point, that it can tip either way. It's also possible that Aerith could also somehow separate or sever the tie between Cloud and Sephiroth. And the reason that he's trying to keep Cloud close to him is because the potential of Cloud maybe being cured by Aerith is a strong possibility, and maybe Sephiroth already knows this. Cloud refuses, and Sephiroth disarms Cloud, again not wanting to kill him. Because Sephiroth is aware of the events in the future, Sephiroth teases his present self's actions. Not only about Meteor and or Aerith's death, through the seven seconds line, because destiny is now uncertain, Sephiroth is curious to see whether Cloud will willfully take the course of action to prevent these things from happening, or whether he will do nothing. The choice is now Cloud's. Sephiroth has constantly referred to Cloud as a puppet, and I think now that some of the strings are cut from Cloud, Sephiroth is just really curious to see what direction Cloud will take on his own, if any. This is sort of an aside, but I really wanted to know where does this part of the game take place? Yeah, the edge of creation, but where in space? I know that this is likely the same place that they do the final battle in the end of Final Fantasy VII, but we can see that there is a whole bunch of space in the background now. I did some dicking around, and I found some pretty interesting things on this too. First of all, the relevance of Sephiroth's fascination with the space he is gazing into. Because of Sephiroth's actions throughout Remake, all of the things he's looking at are places he wants to infect through the live streams of Gaia. And this isn't bullshit, what we're looking at is inside the galaxy of Final Fantasy VII's universe. When we get to the edge of creation, we see two separate galaxies 
the one behind Cloud, and then this large one that Sephiroth is looking at. And it is notable that there's a green planet to the side of it. I think that that's Gaia. The body of space that Sephiroth is looking at, I think is depicted in Dirge of Cerberus. We see the camera zoom into the galaxy, a galaxy that is also depicted in Sephiroth's attack supernova. Yeah, no shit. A move that has us break into a separate reality where we see all of life in the solar system explode. So we go into the galaxy into what looks like the same thing that Sephiroth is staring at, and past that is Gaia. And that would make a lot of sense for the way that things are lined up here in Final Fantasy VII Remake. And oddly enough, this area has a lot of references to Supernova. When Harbinger Sephiroth clashes with Cloud, there's a burst of light. This burst of light is very reminiscent and has all of the same colors of Safer Sephiroth's boss fight. There's one other notable thing, that there is this red formation behind Cloud that looks similar to a part of the universe that we see in Supernova. I think that this is all pretty deliberate. Um, this is the only part that I'm not 100% sure of. So we know that there's somewhere in the galaxy of the Final Fantasy VII universe, but what are they standing on? We can see in the background of the final boss fight with Sephiroth that there's the meteor from Final Fantasy VII. So I think the place that you're standing on is actually on top of the meteor that eventually crashes into the planet. And this is actually really significant for something later when we talk about Genova, but I'm gonna talk about that at the end of the video. And if you think that some of these observations are goofy is because some of them are. But it's funny that Final Fantasy VII has actually remained pretty consistent in depicting their celestial bodies throughout the games. Now for the aftermath. After this, the specters explode into a ball of light. We see the single speck flow into Biggs and he awakens. Long story short, this gives a lot of weight to the idea that the specters that we have been seeing through the entirety of the game consists of the souls of those who belong in the life stream, infected souls. As we know from On the Way to a Smile, Aerith heals the tormented spirits, and they are able to re-enter the life stream. This serves the same function. The specters are freed from the control of Sephiroth, and the souls are able to return to where they once belonged. This has some pretty interesting implications as far as what will happen from here on out regarding the interaction with the life stream. It's a pretty odd implication that this has because usually once a soul is freed, they return to the life stream. I'm imagining that the reason why this is happening is probably because of Aerith, but what we know of the timeline being linked to the live stream and having the ghosts no longer be a factor of the remake, I'm not exactly sure what the implications of this spirit returning to Biggs is and it could just be much larger than I know. It's just something to think about. Also, I believe that Big Soul is the one that kills Barrett when he's stabbed. Barrett awakens and the spirit lingers. Barrett thanks the specter and it flies away. I really think that this isn't a coincidence. I think that Biggs is going out of his way to be the one who saves his friend. We are shown the little bits of light in Zack's timeline in the scene with the landlady and Biggs, but we're not shown this light when we see Merlene or Barrett and the rest of the party. So even if Biggs is alive, the fact that the sparkles are related to a new direction for Zack, I think it's fair to say that this just opens up the door for us as the player to know that somewhere out in time these characters lived and that their souls were freed. So we're done with Remake. Uh, so you're probably thinking to yourself that this is the end of the video, right? No. <laughs> Because Crisis Core actually has so much information in it as far as what it pertains to Remake and beyond Remake that I actually decided to leave Crisis Core as a talking piece for the end of the video. Now for one of the most unexpected gold mines of the compilation, we finally turn to Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core. No, we're not talking about Zack and the multiverse timeline shit, not, not in this video. The reason why I'm talking about Crisis Core now, and the reason that I didn't talk about it at the beginning, because the other compilation stories needed to be addressed in order to give proper context for fully discussing the events that take place in Crisis Core. I'm going to be talking about Loveless, and its connection to the timeline of the livestream. And if you think that I'm fucking kidding, <laughs> hold on, because I'm about to blow your fucking mind, I guess. Loveless is notably Genesis's talking piece, uh, but this isn't what's notable about it. There is truth behind the text that Genesis is reading, and that text and the secrets that it holds have a lot of significance to the compilation. So much truth that it takes up a majority of this conversation. <laughs> I can just imagine people being like, really? Loveless? Huh. Alright. 
well, this theory is going in a great direction. But in order to give you context of what kind of purpose this represents in Crisis Core, you need to understand one particular character in Crisis Core that doesn't have a presence in any other game so far, and that is Minerva is a mysterious character in Crisis Core, and is first physically depicted by a statue that Genesis finds. Genesis calls her the goddess that is referred to in Loveless, but uh, even though I don't believe that she is the goddess, she still holds an important role in the story and definitely needs to be noted. I mean, she has a statue for God's sakes. We learn that there is a massive presence of the life stream that surrounds this area, and a huge amount of energy is contained in this huge materia. We also get to see her in the flesh after Genesis' death. All things considered, she is a character that is shown to have a serious connection to the life stream. Most likely that she's a part of the pure-blooded Cetra. This is noted through the fact that she has green eyes, which Aerith has, and is kind of like a, a tip-off, so to speak. It's also notable that she is mentioned directly by developers, that she carries out the judgment of the life stream when sentencing Genesis to his fate. The image of Minerva and her actions and expressions is a reflection of the will of the life stream. Minerva's facial expressions are meant to be hints to the life stream's judgment, such as Genesis has not yet completed his duty as soldier, and Genesis still has much left to learn. From these quotes, we can see that she has a direct connection to the life stream, and that this is particularly noted that Aerith is able to do the same thing here. The judgment of Genesis is the same judgment that Aerith offers Kadaj at the end of Advent Children. It's really important to note here that there's probably a really good reason why Minerva did not send Genesis into the livestream. Minerva is probably aware that Genesis contains Genova cells, which would have the same effect of Geostigma on the livestream, or even worse, that he would have the same effect on the livestream as Sephiroth has. And the fact that Aerith grants this to Kadaj, the fact that Aerith is able to heal Kadaj through her healing reign, means that it is safe for him to enter the life stream, while as Genesis is not granted the same access. It's also notable that through touch, they are able to give the ones that are being judged access into the life stream. Again, mentioning Aerith only solidifies this idea, where we can see that Minerva just wants nothing to do with Genesis. We can also give validity to Loveless, as in Loveless, there is a bow. Act 4. My memories, the fates are cruel. There are no dreams. No honor remains. The arrow has left the bow of the goddess. The mentions of the bow is Minerva's weapon in Crisis Core. Also, this is exactly how things play out for Genesis when he meets Minerva, as his fate is to be cast away. Minerva is seen depicted in the statue wearing these robes. We see a character similar to that in the remake in Shinra's VR segment. She is the one interacting with the livestream, and is shown to be making her own materia. It's also notable that the area that we're zooming into has a lot of similarities to the Benora Underground, which is where we find Minerva. Also, notice the fact that there are considerably less crystals in the cave in Crisis Core as they are depicted in the cave from Remake. This is just to illustrate how much of the life stream Shinra has taken. There are two different versions of this statue, one being from Japan and one being from the US. Both of them depict similar garb that the Cetra are seen wearing in the VR world. They might not be her, but the fact that the game is depicting the Cetra in this way is the same way that they are depicted in both versions of the statue in Crisis Core does not seem very coincidental. Her presence is felt through the special apples, through Benora White Apples to be specific, which one theory suggests that the apples are extremely healthy for you, so healthy in fact that they can provide a longer, healthier life. This is the same presence that Aerith has as a Cetra through the flowers that grow in the church. God, that is so crazy, huh? Both the flower and the apples are seen as signs of life, and both of these characters are seen depicted in holy areas, Aerith being associated with the church, and Minerva being associated with the statue, which this area could have very easily been associated with a place of worship. It's also very relevant that both of these areas contain healing properties. In Advent Children, underneath the flowers is a bed of water that rises up after the flowers are blown away. This is the cure for Geostigma. Minerva's giant materia that is below the area where the apples grow have the power to heal Genesis of his affliction due to his unstable body, both of these being able to cure anything related to Genova. 
Holy fuck. The last notable thing I'm going to mention about Minerva and Aerith uh, in this particular part of the video is the fact that Minerva is constantly referred to as a goddess. This is referred to through the materia, the goddess materia. This is referred to by Genesis. Aerith gets referred to something similar a lot through Advent Children as well. She's often confused as the mother. The fact that the movie and the game make this reference isn't a coincidence either. It's also notable that the Benora Apples are seen in the remake, and I know that they're seen in other Final Fantasy games, but because of the connection between Minerva and Aerith, I see it less as a nod in Final Fantasy VII Remake and more of a foreshadowing. The fact that the apples still grow, the fact that we see a poster of the Benora Apples being used as a soft drink, means that the presence that Minerva had might still exist, and I think it's entirely possible that the game is setting her up for further elaboration. I, I believe that the materia that we see in the underground here houses Minerva, which is really strange because that's something that we can only see being depicted in Sephiroth and the weapons, as they are also contained in large materia. I think that this connection is specifically here to elaborate on something that Minerva can do. In Crisis Core, Benora White Apples have a different name called Dumb Apples. The reason they're called Dumb Apples is because the apples seemingly come around at random throughout the year. This is not a coincidence. I think that Minerva is able to travel through the live stream to other areas. It's also notable where you fight Minerva is in a cave located near the northern crater. So the fact that she appears at the northern crater in Benora and possibly inside of Midgar is not a coincidence. It's also notable that the church that Aerith goes to most likely is a church that is dedicated to Minerva. I think that she travels to these different places, and without her presence, the apples do not grow in Benora. This role of the Traveler is going to come up when we start talking about Loveless, so just keep this in mind for then. This is also something that we know of Sephiroth, because when he is tossed into the Mako reactor and enters the livestream, he somehow appears at the Northern Crater. Another connection that Minerva has to Sephiroth is actually seen in his final form, Safer Sephiroth from Final Fantasy VII. You can see that there are a lot of depictions of this circular sort of structure, and Minerva seemingly has this too on the wheel on her back. It's notable that through reading some of the mission descriptions in Crisis Core, that machines are influenced by the livestream. This is super important because I think that this is how the weapons were made. Because Minerva and other Cetra were able to create technology way beyond the normal level of understanding, I think the Cetra are completely aware of the balance that the livestream is trying to reinforce and the direction of its future. We can note this in the fact that Aerith is able to see the Spectres because she is a Cetra, and this just leaves the implication that the Cetra are able to see into the future just as Aerith is in Final Fantasy VII Remake. And this understanding of the timeline that the Cetra have is directly tied into Shinra. Yeah. More of this at the end of the video. And now we're going and now we're gonna go address Loveless. Loveless is a poem of unknown origin and has a prologue and five acts all of which have some relevance to the events of Final Fantasy VII and the compilation. The main takeaway of Loveless is this. The balance of good and evil, three friends are depicted in the poem as told by Genesis, the roles of the characters, and that the fifth chapter is missing from Loveless. The prologue reads, When the War of the Beasts bring about the world's end, the goddess descends from the sky. Wings of light and dark spread afar. She guides us to bliss, her gift everlasting. Loveless introduces the idea that there are two separate elements that are balancing themselves out in this world, light and dark. Again mentioning Rufus's comment, when evil comes to destroy the planet, the life stream and its inhabitants come to stop this. This example can be seen with the fact that after Sephiroth summons Meteor with the Black Materia, the weapons respond to its summoning. The planet attempts to match the light with the dark. Time and time again, this has happened throughout the history of the world. Genova and the Cetra, and in my opinion, Minerva. In Final Fantasy VII, the battle with Sephiroth and Genova. And again in Advent Children with Sephiroth and Cloud. All of these clashes against good and evil for the fate of the world. What is important to remember is that at the end of all of these battles, the world balances itself out to compensate for the other. But there are other meanings to pull from this. Wings of light and wings of dark? 
Why does that sound familiar? Well, these are obviously the wings represented in the characters in Crisis Core. The Black Wings are those who are born of Dark, Genesis, and Sephiroth. Note that Genova herself has wing-like pieces attached to her back, and the White Wings being born from Cetra cells, Ariel being genetically born from the Cetra. Notable that Minerva also shares this association. This isn't the only parallel that Final Fantasy VII makes to these colors. This is depicted through the White Materia, the Ultimate Healing Magic, and the Black Materia, the strongest magic used for destruction. This is also noted in the short stories in On the Way to a Smile, Sephiroth's chapter being black and Aerith's being white. In Dirge, this also comes into play, as Vincent represents Chaos, being the one who's supposed to fucking murder everyone in order to return them to the planet, and Omega as the vessel for the Earth's entire life stream, with the sole purpose of carrying it to safety into the cosmos. It's good to note that these characters also have these wings to match their connections to their function in the balance. Know, just before we get to the other part of Loveless, that all of these events and all of these depictions are repeating throughout time. I think one of these elements that we can see is actually in Safer Sephiroth and Genova, whereas Safer Sephiroth looked like this at the end of Final Fantasy VII. I am pretty sure that Genova also was represented in this way before we see her in the events of Final Fantasy VII. But I'm gonna be talking about that in the part two of this video. Three friends are depicted in the poem as told by Genesis. Another interesting aspect of Loveless is that Genesis mentions three friends. This archetype also has a presence throughout time in the compilation. It's understood by Genesis in Crisis Core that the three friends represented in the story are himself, Angeal, and Sephiroth. We can easily do the same thing for the second installment in the timeline, being Final Fantasy VII, being as there's three teammate slots in your party, and in Advent Children, there are three remnants of Sephiroth. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, well, two of those groups are bad guys, but that's actually kind of the point. Time fluctuates back and forth, as described in Advent Children by Rufus. Genesis, Sephiroth, and Ariel all turn out to be villains to the story. The second group turns out to be good because you defeat Sephiroth and save the planet. And then in Advent Children, it fluctuates back to villainous with Kadaj, Laz, and Yazoo. I hate that name. That's the only reason I've been calling them the boys. In Remake, this same archetype appears. The three friends depicted in the story are also depicted as avatars by the three whispers summoned by the Harbinger. I know that there's a lot of people who suggest that these three are Kadajan friends. I think that that has the strongest bearings just because of their weapons. For this discussion, they are just meant to represent the three friend avatars, perhaps a collection of the heroes that represented these roles. Maybe they're the first to represent them, or the last, who, who knows? To add some fuel to the fire, we see Gadaj summon Bahamut in Advent Children. But this is something that we have seen Genesis do in Crisis Core as well, and your party does the same. This evidence suggests that Loveless has something to do with the cycle of time that the life stream creates. This is also subtly implied through the fact that Loveless has been adapted several times since its creation. We have the poem and the play, the same story being told throughout time. It's also noted that there are specific roles that the friends play in the story. The hero, the slave, and the traveler. The archetype of the hero can be seen pretty clearly in Cloud. Cloud being the living legacy of Zack. And I don't think it's too far of a jump to make that Minerva's legacy is Aerith. The fact that they are so similar and are depicted in the same ways almost identically is proof enough to fit the archetype. The archetype of the traveler and the hero. And Kadaj being the slave, being notably the legacy of Sephiroth. Zack in Crisis Core being the hero and Genesis being the slave, as noted by Genesis, and Angeal being the traveler, and also being associated with the Cetra. The fifth chapter is missing from Loveless. This is actually the most intriguing element to me because the final act of Loveless is actually missing. Genesis creates his own rendition of the ending, and I get that this is used as a way of giving his character some closure, but knowing his fate at the end of the game, I don't think that there's much truth to it. But I think we're supposed to be left wondering about what the last page was meant to say and even more now for a couple of reasons. I don't think that it's a coincidence that there are five acts of Loveless, and that recently Nomura announced that Final Fantasy VII Remake was the fifth and final installment of the series. 
especially because of the future of Remake seems so uncertain, and to have this page from the book that seemingly connects itself in more ways than one to the compilation, having this ending purposefully removed is really a puzzling thing. And then there is this line in the remake about the play Loveless and how the ending is different. Loveless musical was absolutely brilliant. So was this different from the annual production? The finale's a touch different, but if you see it for yourself, you'll understand. This could be alluding to the fact that the Genesis ending is not the way the story ends, but the way that the story is meant to be told and that the true ending of Loveless has some deeper significance. I know that this is also supposed to allude to the end of Remake and how it's so different, and it's a very meta moment, but because of how densely layered Remake is with its dialogue, it's not hard to think that this could easily mean more than just the one reference. What comes from all of this? Is there any more meaning to derive from Loveless and all of its acts? We talked about Sephiroth's intentions and that his destiny is freed from the live stream. We talked about the balance that our party has just shattered and that all of the details contribute directly to the repercussion of our actions in Remake. The Cetra's intentions of balance show us that their intentions are only for the planet. That seems like a very Shinra thing to do and maybe there is more of a connection to them and how that is directly linked to Before Crisis? What about Rufus? He did not agitate the timeline in any way, or come into contact with Aerith. What are the implications of this? We know about his father, but what about his mother? We know that Minerva is out there, and her Cetra heritage seemingly connects to the Book of Loveless, and she has direct ties to Aerith in many ways. Will she reappear in Remake? There is a goddess in the Book of Loveless. If Minerva is not the goddess, who is? What is the purpose of the representation of only one wing? on Genesis, Sephiroth, and Angeal. I didn't even talk about Genesis. What was his fate? And does he have a part in Remake? All of these questions will be answered in a part two of the video. And I didn't even get to uh, explain how much Aerith knows. Uh, I guess that means we'll answer that in... <laughs>